Como sí, sí. Inglés, inglés sería preferible para que, digamos, los que estén, digamos, por fuera. Y, okay. Iván me dijo que se iban a conectar varios de allá de San Diego, entonces, pues, inglés okay. sería mejor. Ok. Listo, ya estamos en YouTube, en vivo. Tenemos 20 personas, 22. Esa se me estaba olvidando, poner esto en silencio. Ok, voy a empezar a emitir la gente en, Dale. en Zoom. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. Hola. Hola, hola. Está, estamos a punto de empezar. Ya, ya, les, ya les damos el aviso cuando empecemos a transmitir en, en YouTube, ¿vale? Eh, Diego, tú eres el, el main. Entonces, eh, tú te encargas de todo el resto ya. ¿Estás ahí, Miguel? ¿Cómo? Bien. Ainda, todavía tenemos cuatro minutitos, ¿sí? ¿Cuatro? ¿Qué horas son? Son las 2.59. Bueno, un minuto. <risa> ok, go ahead, Diego. Bueno, well, eh, buenas tardes a todos. Buenas tardes, good afternoon to everybody. It is a pleasure to have, a, have you present in this new webinar. After this webinar, we will have some minutes for questions and round table to discuss things related to Latin American magnetism. So this event is organized by ALMA, Latin American Magnetism Association, Association Latin American Magnetism, Association Latin American Magnetism which in turn is under construction. So we invite all of those who want to join the initiative. Please send, us, send to us an email for any question or proposal. Uh, the webinar will be transmitted via Zoom or in our YouTube channel. We also have a Facebook page that is constantly updated. Uh, through the YouTube channel also, we can, you can see the past uh, webinars. And well, currently we are four people responsible for the initiative, uh, the international nodes and coordinating the, the initiative, but there are also meeting in different countries, contributing with ideas and proposals. So the ones who are coordinating now is Juan Gabriel from, from Los Andes University, Dora Albit from University of Santiago de Chile, Francisco Sanchez from Universidad Nacional de La Plata, and me from Unicamp. As you can see, we are only four from Colombia, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and South America is much more bigger. So we invite people from other countries to be part, an active part and hands on on this, this initiative. So we have several confirmed 
candidates for different countries as next, as next speakers. Iman Schuller from USA, Sergio Resende from Brazil, Patricio Vargas from Chile, Mayelena Gomez from Colombia, and Marcela Fernandez Van Rapp from Argentina. Marcela Fernandez Van Rapp is from Physics Department of Physics Institute of University of La Plata. She's going to talk about uh, magnetic nanomedicines and is going to be the next month during the afternoon. Uh, now it's my pleasure to present the chairman of this webinar, Johan Restrepo Cardenas from Antioch University. He's full professor since 1999, director of the group of magnetism and simulation dedicated to the study of magnetic properties of nanostructure system. As can be seen, Johan's have a solid and well-established career. So it's an honor to have Johan as a chairman of this session. So please, Johans, if you want to start. Thank you very much, Diego, and welcome everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge the invitation for being the chairman of this session. It's a very great honor for me to be the chairman of this ALMA webinar today. So welcome everybody and have most of all the opportunity of introducing Professor Miguel Kibi, which is not an easy task. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is a very difficult task to summarize a whole life dedicated to science, teaching, formation of students, and also even to some administrative issues. As a person, I want to begin uh, uh, talking about uh, Miguel Kibi as person, I can say that Professor Kibi loves Sudoku. <laughs> he loves reading books. As a matter of fact, he has a formidable and enviable library in his house. But most of all, he loves physics more. Professor Kibi is a tireless and an enormous enthusiast about physics, particularly solid state physics and condensed matter physics. And I am convinced that this love for physics and his dedication led him to receive the Chilean National Science Award in 2007. So Miguel, it was not just a matter of luck as Professor Kivi has said in some interviews uh, from his humility and modesty. What more can I say about Professor Kivi? Professor Kivi has a great sense of humor. I have coincided with him in some several conferences and the sense of humor is a very important part of his life. A trajectory of almost 60 years, perhaps I am wrong about that uh, amount of time, but in any case, it's a whole life dedicated to research and teaching. He has been full and tenured professor, both at the Catholic University and also at the Department of Physics of the Faculty of Sciences at the University of Chile. Mechanical engineer from the Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria in 1963 in a subject related to with high vacuum technologies, graduated with the highest distinction. Also doctor in physics from the University of Virginia in US and finally, member and president in some cases of several societies, including the American Physical Society, the Chilean Physics Society, and some others. So thank you very much, Miguel, for accepting this invitation. And uh, your talk will be about exchange bias. Let me see the title of the talk. Exchange bias, basic physics and applications. So the, the stage is yours, dear Miguel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, how... So Miguel, if you want, you can share your, your screen. Okay. That's it. Okay. Well, uh, after a long physics career, uh, I am still quite nervous today because it's the first time I have a talk 
which in which I don't see directly your faces and your reactions. And this is a new experience for me. I have been teaching this way the last two semesters, and it has been no easy task. Uh, after so many years of uh, presential classes, to be talking to a computer is not that familiar to me. So let's start. The exchange bias has been part of my love for physics. I was introduced to the field by Ivan Schuller, and much of this work has, was done in collaboration with him and several other people which I mentioned throughout the talk. So the outline of this talk is as follows. I'll start with an introduction which assumes that uh, people don't know anything about it. So I'll introduce the, the ideas and the early models and the advances later on. I'll do a review of the models. I'll talk a little bit about applications, which are very important. Then I'll go into early theories, semi-classical theories, recent experimental results, and then something more recent, which is quantum fluctuations and dipole coupling, uh, which lead to, model, uh, to a model of exchange bias in some strange cases. And uh, I'll, then I'll talk about a, a little bit about the relation between exchange bias and the yaroshinsky morija interaction on which we are working right now. And then I'll draw some conclusions. Exchange bias is a phenomenon that was discovered 64 years ago by Michael, John, and Bean. But even today, a full understanding has not been achieved. So what's the basics of this? The basics is that it occurs when we have a ferromagnet and an antiferromagnet in contact. And the signature for exchange bias is that the magnetization loop, instead of being centered at the origin, shifts in general to the left, to negative values of age. It also occurs for positive values of age, but uh, more, more usually it is negative, there is negative exchange bias. So it is enough to have a ferromagnet and an antiferromagnet in contact. For the phenomenon to be detectable, the ferromagnet has to be quite thin. That is, a couple of, at most a couple of hundred mag uh, atomic layers. So then I'll introduce the idea of the uncompensated interface. Here we have a ferromagnet oriented to the right and an antiferromagnet which has a non-compensated la uh, last layer. That what it means is that the last layer has the last layer next to the interface has a magnetic moment. You also can have comp compensated magnetic interfaces in which, for example, you cut the crystal along this direction. So the, here you have a spin to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left, and the, there is no magnetic moment at the interface. But thinking naively, you would expect that this is the most favorable geometry for exchange bias. It turns out it isn't, but one could imagine that. And that leads us to a naive picture of exchange bias. 
Here you have, I am assuming, an, a ferromagnetic coupling across the interface between the antiferromagnet in red and the ferromagnet in blue. So when you, the field is zero, this is the most favorable configuration. The spins here at the interface are happy. They don't want to move. So I have to apply an external field, in this case, pointing toward the left. And that makes the speed, it, that creates a competition between the Zeeman energy and the exchange at the interface. When the Zeeman energy is large enough, the ferromagnetic magnetization flips to the left. This is obviously is an idealized theoretical magnetization loop. It has nothing much to do with reality, which things are more complex. As you, again, I, the field uh, increases toward the right, these spins are eager to return to the original position. So when the field is still non-zero, they flick back. And there is some hysteresis, which is related to defects at the interface uh, in the ferromagnet and in the antiferromagnet. But for uh, the time being, I will ignore completely coercing. Now here, the amazing thing is this, that this naive picture uh, gives us a value for exchange bias for the, this field, the center compared to the origin, which is a, a 10 or 100 times too large. So it doesn't work. And the, the curious thing is that exchange bias is most effective and largest, not for uncompensated interfaces, but for compensated interfaces. So here we have a compensated interface in which the interaction across the interface makes half of the spins at the interface happy and half of them unhappy or frustrated. Here we have, for example, the, if we assume an antiferromagnetic interface exchange, this spin and this spin will be happy, but this one and this one will not. So half of the spins will be happy and half of the spins will be frustrated. In this configuration, which has exactly the same energy as this one. The energy, the frustration energy is the same in this configuration and in this one. Here, all the spins at the interface are half happy or half frustrated as you wish. So none of them is happy. None of them is completely frustrated. So the two, these two, configurations have exactly the same energy. Now let's go to the applications and then I'll go back to the theory. The applications are mostly related to the giant magneto resistance effect for which Fert and Greenberg received the Nobel Prize in 2007. It, it works as follows. When two, the two, when you have two ferromagnets separated by a metallic spacer, for example, copper. So let's say cobalt, copper, cobalt. In this configuration, the resistivity is much lower than in the one at the left. So something happens across the inter, across the the spacer layer, the metallic spacer layer, 
which makes the resistance much larger for this configuration than for this one. And the coefficient that is defined is the resistivity of the anti-parallel minus the resistivity of the parallel divided by the resistivity of the parallel. This, uh, as I said, was recognized by a Nobel Prize because it led to very important applications. And the applications were as follows. You have a substrate, these are thin films. A substrate, usually uh, aluminum oxide or some, some insulator. You have a ferromagnetic layer, perdón, sorry, an anti-ferromagnetic layer de deposited on the substrate. Then you have a ferromagnetic layer. And since here you have a ferromagnet and an anti-ferromagnet in contact, they, uh, the ferromagnet is pinned by the antiferromagnet and at zero field it has a fixed orientation. Then you add again a, a spatial layer, a metallic spatial layer, say again copper, and on top you deposit another ferromagnet which is free to orient itself in one of the two directions. So here at the right, you have exactly the same configuration, however, upside down. Uh, the gravity doesn't enter, so upside down doesn't matter much. But in, the, in this drawing, the blue one is again the anti-ferromagnet uh, reference. The pinned layer is the orange one. The spacer is the gray one, and the free magnetic layer is the green one, which can be then be oriented by an external magnet. So if the external magnet points to the left, the, the free layer also points to the left, and this is a low resistance configuration. While if the external magnet points to the right, the configuration at the right here is the high resistivity configuration. So you can move the orientation, you can change the orientation of the ferromagnetic free layer, left and right, and produce then a different resistivity configurations. This is, leads then to reading heads. Here you have a magnetic tape, a magnetic disc, a magnet or whatever that moves full speed either to the right or to the left. And if when the region magnetized to the left uh, is below the, this device, the ferromagnet orients to the left and we are in the high resistivity configuration. If it happens that it is the blue one or pointing to the right, the one that is below the free layer of the ferrom uh, free ferromagnetic layer, then the resistivity is low. So it reads whatever the zeros and ones that are written in the magnetic tape, magnetic disk, or whatever. This has two advantages. It makes reading the information much easier because you read directly resistivity. Before this, what you read, it was a DeFi DT. The change in flux as a, 
function of time as the tape moved next to the reading head. And that has a disadvantage that the uh, density you can imprint on the disc or the tape is much lower than if you read directly the magnetization. And the other advantage it has is that, for example, for a disc, where the outer part of the disc moves much more, much faster than the inner part, it, if you measure the fire PT, you can put less information next to the center and more near to the uh, to the diameter of the, the near the full diameter of the, the disc because they move at different speeds. So it has the advantage of making reading of reading directly in magnetization instead of the change of flux and the advantage that the uh, density you can uh, have when the tape is much higher. So this is a, then a, a magnetic recording uh, head, which has exactly this configuration, the antiferromagnetic uh, substrate, the ferromagnetic reference, the spacer, the metallic spacer, and here the sensor, which reads either zeros or one. You can use it uh, for recording heads, for magnetic memory cells, for, for whatever. And this has changed dramatically the magnetic recording industry. Let's go back to theories then. If you have a compensated interface, it looks more or less like this. Uh, as I mentioned, all these pins here at the interface are half frustrated or half happy. Uh, because they, they like to be either parallel or anti-parallel to the ferromagnet. So the, you write a Hamiltonian for this, in which you have to consider for the anti-ferromagnetic basically all these terms, the exchange of, for the, of the anti-ferromagnet, the exchange constant, the spin of the uh, anti of the antiferromagnet and the difference between the two sub lattices. Then you have the uh, anisotropy term and the Zeeman term. This describes the antiferromagnet. For the interface, you have an exchange between ferro and antiferro, which couples the two sub lattices of the antiferro with the ferro. S1 is the first layer of the ferromagnet. And then you write more or less the same for the ferromagnet. You have only one sublattice here. One, you don't have sublattices. So you have the exchange for the ferro and the interaction between the spins, the anisotropy, and the Zeeman term. You can write the energy for this configuration. And uh, in terms of these reduced units, E is the non-dimensional energy. H is a non-dimensional field, which is of the order of 10 to the minus 3. Kappa is the relative anisotropy, relative uh, strength of the exchange. And D is the anisotropy, also in units of the ferromagnetic exchange. You can minimize this expression and solve it either numerically or by means of Monte Carlo simulation. And this leads to uh, this configuration for minimum energy. That is, the ferromagnet is basically oriented orthogonal to the magnetization of the antiferromagnetic layers. The first layer is canted opposite to the direction of the 
magnetization of the ferromagnet, and it is canted slightly. But this is what originates the exchange bias phenomena. So it breaks the, it reduces the energy of the half frustrated system by a small canting. This canting, because of the strong exchange in the antiferromagnet, it does not extend far beyond the first layer. Actually, it, it is very local. And if you compare the experimental results with this theory, they are in quite good agreement. The only adjustable term is the unknown par uh, interaction at the, inter the, the unknown exchange at the interface. And uh, it, you get a good fit with experiment for, uh, in this case, for a, for a certain system for value 1.2 milli electron volts. And the Monte Carlo simulations, which are these uh, squares, coincide quite well with the numerical solution. So in summary, the semi-classical theories works well for compensated antiferromagnetic interfaces. It is based on the freezing of a kind of a spin glass, like uh, of uh, the canted uh, interface layer. It has just one adjustable parameter, the interface exchange, which is not accessible experimentally. It, there is good agreement between numerical simulations and, uh, and numerical solutions. And the results are consistent with experiments. Now, more recent experiments had a big surprise. The big surprise was that when the antiferromagnet, in this case, uh, iron fluoride, is not in contact with the ferromagnet, the phenomenon also occurs. One would not expect, in principle, to have an exchange bias in two layers which are separated by a distance of uh, some tens of angstroms. You know that the exchange is very, very short range. So you don't expect an effect beyond say three or four or five angstroms. And here you observe it for distances of the order of 70 angstroms. Now, please notice that this drawing is completely out of scale. This here are 30 millimeters. And this on vertical scale is of the order of angstroms. So you have here a, an antiferromagnetic layer of around 700 angstroms compared to 30 millimeters, which is enormous. So the slope of this line in practice is very, very, very low. It's an angle which is below, smaller than one degree. And the aluminum is simply a cap for avoid, to avoid oxidation. And the experimental results are these. For eight angstroms, you observe negative exchange bias. when the system is cooled uh, for a cooling field of 100 Ersted. When you get to 500 Ersted, you get po both positive and negative exchange bias. And when you increase the field, the cooling field to 2,500 Ersted, the exchange bias becomes positive. This set a completely new problem. So we worked on a theory for this. We had to eliminate all other factors. And uh, Ivan told me not to mention Sir Arthur Conan Doyle because 
young people don't read Sherlock Holmes anymore. But for the older ones who, when they were young, read uh, about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, this is uh, what Sherlock told Dr. Watson, eliminate all other factors and the one which remains must be the truth. So we eliminate all other factors and the only one left for an interaction which is so long range is the dipolar interaction. So let me go through this here. For an antiferromagnet, the relevant other parameter is not the magnetization, but the staggered magnetization. So staggered magnetization is the, we, we have to subtract the magnetization of one of the antiferromagnet sublattices with the other. So this in a perfect antiferromagnet is zero, but if the antiferromagnet is not perfect, we get a staggered magnetization. So the Hamiltonian now is simply the exchange and this staggered magnetization is not a constant of the motion because it does not commute with the Hamiltonian. So when there is translation and invariance, the two sublattices have the same magnetization, but when translational invariance is broken, for example, by the presence of, a of an interface or a surface, then the, mag the staggered magnetization is non-zero. So we developed a model which is based on the following. Quantum fluctuations in the antiferromagnet, in addition to symmetry breaking, this reduces the net magnetization in the antiferromagnet by quantum fluctuations. So we have quantum fluctuations in the antiferromagnet. This in turn generates a two dipole moment density, which creates a dipole field and the dipole field leads to exchange bias. So the, the, again, the theoretical model is based on the breaking of the antiferromagnetic symmetry in the vicinity of the AFM paramagnetic interface by quantum fluctuations. This creates a long range dipolar coupling and the competition between Zeeman and dipolar field that controls the magnitude and sign of the exchange bias. So you can write the energies again. Uh, here mu zero is the vacuum permeability, beta is the angle between the applied field and the ferromagnetic anisotropy axis, this beta. Zeta one and zeta two are the angles between the applied field and the magnetizations of domains one and two. And this is the model illustration. What we have is here a region of the, uh, this is the antiferromagnet, it's compensated by, but the quantum fluctuations create a small magnetization in regions of the antiferromagnet. These create a dipole moment which couples to regions of the ferromagnet. This is obviously a cartoon, very schematic. So it's not that uh, you have a, at the right uh, a, a region fer oriented opposite to the magnetization. What you have is islands of uh, magnetization in the ferromagnet opposite to the direction of the, satu of the saturation. As you increase the cooling field, these regions become larger and larger. And this is what leads finally to negative exchange bias, positive exchange bias, zero exchange bias, that is compared both, posit both positive and negative. And finally for 2,500 Ersted, uh, positive exchange bias. So here you have mostly uh, the regions of which are point opposite to the cooling field. Well, again, you develop a theoretical model 
where you uh, calculate the interaction energy. And after uh, some algebra, it gives you the magnitude of the negative and the positive exchange bias fields. And again, I come to the recent experiments. These are the recent experiments. And our theoretical model gives you a, a critical value for a critical thickness of the spacer for the transition from positive to negative. The order of magnitude is correct. There is a strong, a certain deviation, which is not too good, but not too bad. And then we fit here the critic, sorry, we fit here the exchange bias field as a function of the thickness of the spacer. The experimental uh, values are the inverted triangles. The theory is the red line. When the field is in increased from 100 to 500, we see a transition from negative exchange bias to positive exchange bias with a transition region. And finally, when uh, we apply a, a cooling field of 2,500 Ersts, the fit is quite good and gives positive exchange bias. All this is uh, well documented in this paper in nanoscale of 2017, which was done by Felipe Torres, Rafael Morales from Spain, uh, and Ivan Schuller, who did the experimental part, and myself uh, with Felipe Torres, we did the theoretical part. So now I switch to another field. These quantum fluctuations should not be confused with the dalosinski morija interaction, the, in, in which you could think they are similar, but they are completely different. Quantum fluctuations are quantum, and the dalosinski morija interaction uh, has its origin in low symmetry and spin orbit coupling. Spin orbit coupling is a relativistic effect, so it has nothing to do with uh, quantum mechanics. And it is given by this expression, uh, a tensor uh, which gives the magnitude of the exchange of the dialosinski uh, morija interaction times SISJ cross. In instead of being, uh, instead of coupling parallel or anti-parallel, this couples orthogonal. A good reference is this uh, paper by Adeline Crepier and Christian Lacroix. And this has been explored experimentally in brilliant form actually by this paper by Luo and a lot of other people which appeared very recently in science. So they are able to engineer, nano-engineer, a system where you have, uh, for the same uh, system, is uh, this layer, the orange and blue layers are co cobalt. You have regions of perpendicular magnetization, orthogonal to the substrate, and regions of parallel magnetization, and they couple through the the alosinski morija interaction. And this opens many new avenues. You can control magnetization by current, like it is done in this lower right part. And you can try a lot of possible alternatives for the generation of exchange bias. So what we have explored is a system like this, uh, we consider a, a planar system 
with the z-axis coming out of the ball. And we looked at the, at the hysteresis loop of this system, but with some alternative. We, what we did is we pinned the left end, this left end here, in the plus x direction, and the other end in the z direction. So this, they are pinned uh, parallel and orthogonal to the plane. And we, the magnetization loops we get theoretically look like this. Uh, depending on the pinning, we can have positive or negative exchange bias and also an asymmetric uh, hysteresis loop. This is work in progress with Felipe Torres and some postdocs and students, and it looks very promising. So, in conclusion, we have several mechanisms to generate exchange bias, M many very useful technological applications. Freezing of ground state fluctuations leads to a uh, to, in, to exchange bias. Results are in, in general in good agreement with theories, and the dialoshinsky morilla interaction offers additional ingredients for exchange bias systems that are very much worth exploring, and that's what we are doing at present. So thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, dear Professor Miguel Kibi for this interesting and illustrative talk. And the session is open for questions. Uh, let me see if we have any question here in the two platforms in Zoom. We don't have any question right here. And in YouTube, neither. <laughs> well, uh, meanwhile, I have a couple of questions perhaps. Uh, about your recent results um, in collaboration with uh, Felipe Torres, yeah. uh, how do you arrive to the geometry in form of cross? How, how, do, you, how do you get this initiative in order to um, quantify exchange bias phenomenon? Well, the idea was that, the, you know, we, we, will, we want to look at magnetization and eventually the effect of currents. So the magnetization, uh, the idea is to magnetize along the X axis and to apply a voltage perpendicular to it. So the, the idea is to look at the interaction between current and magnetization and eventually see if we can control magnetization with current and the dialoshinsky morilla interaction. Perfect. Well, any other question? Well, I have a, a, another one. What is the, the effect of lateral dimensions in the, these uh, reading devices using the combination between G, GMR, uh, magnetic resistance, and exchange bias phenomenon? So if the domains are smaller or greater than the exchange length, what, what is the effect of lateral dimensions on the exchange bias phenomenon? Yeah, well, uh, actually the limitation is on how you can write zeros and ones in the ferromagnet that uh, drives the giant magneto resistance. So uh, by this reading heads allowed to reduce the, uh, or to increase the density the reading, the writing density. Okay. So the lateral uh, dimensions are mostly determined by the how small you can make the write the writing, how, how how large you can make the density the, the the writing densities. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Diego Muraca has a question. Go ahead. Uh, well, first, first of all, I would like to 
to thanks because it was very nice the talk. And I would like to ask you about what do you think about a magnetic nanoparticle that are complex nanoparticles and you have two, two magnetic components and could have a chain bias effect. If this nanoparticle could have any potential technological application compared with the, the film or multi, multi films thing? Well, unfortunately, I'm not an expert in, in, in uh, the experimental side, but uh, I imagine that uh, many applications could be done, but the, you know, always the important applications are the ones that are not obvious. The, that are the ones that uh, one cannot imagine, not the ones that can easily be imagined. Uh, that's the role of the, the role of the scientists is to generate alternatives. And the, the technologists, the, the engineers are extremely competent to, in finding applications. So I am, I think the sci we scientists is to try to understand the phenomena and uh, if there are applications fine if not it is uh, it is uh, has been an interesting pro uh, scientific problem but whatever happens is that uh, what most often happens is that anything you do has applications you never imagine and uh, they are important and they lead to the real uh, change of paradigm. The, all the, the important ch paradigmatic changes come all from basic science, not from the application side. The application side uses the paradigm change scientists develop. Science is worse because it understands the basics, the basic mechanisms of nature. Thank you very much, Professor. You. We, have, we have two more questions. One of them in YouTube from Professor Lesio Montaneiro from Curitiba, Brazil. And the question is, what is the common experimental setup to investigate exchange bias? Well, usually this, uh, uh, the, the techniques that are being used is microlithography, of course, and uh, MBE, molecular beam epitaxy, to create these uh, very small uh, systems. Uh, obviously there are people much more better qualified in the audience than me to, to address this question. So let me see who is around. I don't know if Ivan Schuller is around, he will be happy, I guess, to answer this question. Okay, uh, Francisco. Kike, would you like to address your own question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kiwi, for, for the nice uh, talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, my question is, what, what is the effect of roughness uh, at the interface between the anti-ferromagnet and the ferromagnet? Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, well, whatever I have shown you is extremely idealized. Roughness plays an important role in all these systems. And also the, the uh, crystallography is important. The, what, what I showed you was a matched ferromagnet and tonight a ferromagnet. This, is not, this does not correspond to reality. In reality, the crystal structures are different. There is a lot of tension in the, at, the, at the interface. There are a lot of defects at the interface. They are not planar interfaces. All those things play an important role. And 
they are not described in this extremely simple model. <coughs> each one of them, each one of these, these effects deserves special attention and the special theoretical treatment. But they are very important. Uh, is it detrimental to the effect, uh, roughness? It, it can be detrimental, it can be advantageous. Yeah. Because if they create uh, it, they create pinning centers, which are important for the phenomenon also, and can increase the phenomenon. The, the pinning centers are, play a major role in this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francisco. We have another question in YouTube by Professor Patricio Vargas. Uh, Patricio asks Miguel, if disorder controls the dipolar coupling, is there some experimental showing shift of the exchange bias field just by changing disorder? Not that I know, but certainly it is true that the disorder is, is important. The, again, it's the same. The disorder creates pinning centers. And in the antiferromagnet, you have defects which and not all of them, not all of these uh, defects are pinned the same way. So there is a distribution of pinning strengths. Some of them are, are thermally activated. Some of them can be activated by ex an external field. All of these things I have not gone into because they are uh, technically complicated, but they, they play an important role and they have been considered in several theoretical approaches. Uh, thank you, Professor. We have another question from Juan Gabriel in Colombia. Is there any, it's, is there any experimental realization in which the exchange bias can be turned on and turned off with some external stimuli? Uh, well, you could say that the, if for in the last, in the before the last thing I showed, that for example, uh, you can the feeling the the cooling field uh, can create a situation between such that you have positive and negative exchange bias, which cancel each other. So you could cancel the change bias by creating both positive and negative exchange bias simultaneously, such that the net effect is zero. Okay. I think we have another question. Uh, let me see, Professor Kibi. We have another from Victor Gonzalez. Uh, the question is, how could you engineer jalosinski morilla interaction in order to enhance topological structures like skirmions? Yeah, they, they, that's a very interesting question. It can be done. Uh, actually, the, the, by, the, by the systems engineered by Luo and all his group, uh, you could you can do that skirmions do appear and we have also included them in our model and on which we are working now but skirmions are an important part of the ingredient perfect well any other question yes we have one from spain uh, from isaac uh, the question is, is it expected a significant role of the spacer layer in dipolar coupling? What's it, what is the role played by the uh, thickness of the spacer? Well, this, the, the signal, obviously, as the thickness of the spacer is increased, it, I assume it is Isaac Montoya who is asking? It doesn't appear the, uh, then it's the last name. Hmm. Uh, the, the effect uh, diminishes 
as the spacer increase is, is the spacer is increased, but the spacer gives you the possibility of engineering what you get, either positive or negative exchange value. But as the spacer increases, obviously the tripolar interaction is not strong enough to uh, to sustain the phenomena. So the spacer plays a big uh, role, but uh, it is a rather small effect. And uh, if the spacer is uh, beyond, say, 50 angstroms, things start decaying significantly. Another question from Flavia Albarracin. Hi, this is Flavia. A uh, uh, follow up on the schemion question. Do you expect to get schemion lattices? That I don't know. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I do. We do, but uh, we haven't found them yet. It, we haven't gone that far yet. We hope we we hope something like that will uh, emerge, but I cannot assure you that it will. Okay, nice. Well, any other question? Well, I perhaps we are already done it seems no well there i is... thank you all for your patience uh, i never expected that many people to attend <laughs> hi mariana hi all the friends who are have shown up this is one of the advantages in this in these uh, times yeah we we fly from one place to the other at the speed <laughs> of light okay so uh, okay. let's uh, tell me, so, Diego. Uh, so I would like to 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 thanks again to Professor Kivi. It was very nice. Uh, so I I would like to ask to the people to unblock the the camera just to to allow us to take some picture or print from the the screen. Just then to post on Facebook and in the other sites. Uh, also, we are planning to do some round table now. If someone wants to stay and discuss uh, or know what is happening in Argentina, what is happening in Brazil, what is happening in, in Colombia or Chile, the meeting that we had in, in different places, just to, to communicate and, and maybe if anyone wants to contribute or at least uh, be part of this, this could be very great. So I think that, uh, I don't know if somebody is taking some prints, uh, Juan or Maria, are you? Okay. So then we are going to post on Facebook and other places, and if you want to, to access to see, it's, it's nice. Uh, the next webinar is going to be 6th of November, uh, Professor Marcel and Rapp, she's going to talk about uh, magnetic nanomedicines, just for remember. And now I open, the microphone to anyone who wants to talk something or to say something regarding to, to Latin America Magnetics Association or to propose something. I don't know if Francisco or Juan or Maria or, or Dora want to say something about this. Diego, first of all, an applause, uh, please, for uh, Professor Kivi for this uh, talk. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, that's a nice idea, applause. Thank you. Thank you for the initiative. Thank you. Thank you to you, Professor. So, uh, Juan and Maria want to... Oh, Kike, yes, yeah, or... we are going to stop the transmission in, in YouTube, I guess. Okay. Uh, so, thank you everybody in YouTube uh, for joining. Uh, thank you. So.